Hope everybody had a good weekend. Hope you remember it. I did. But these short two-day weekends just kill me, you know. All right, so we've, I looked on the schedule this morning. It looks like we have an exam coming up a week from Friday, so I know that's all on your calendars. And uh, we've got a lot to cover between now and then, so let's dive in. Um, last week I spent a fair amount of time talking about lipids and their chemical properties and the different kinds of lipids that there were. And these chemical properties are important because they carry over into the chemical properties of the cellular components that they comprise. And the most important cellular components uh, comprised by lipids in our uh, cells are the membranes. And so that's what I want to spend some time talking about. First of all, the chemical properties of those membranes, and then uh, the importance of those membranes and the function of those membranes uh, in energy, uh, in energy generation. Well, uh, first I want to talk a little bit about fatty acid effects. So that's the second one down here. Um, I told you that uh, if we took fatty acids and we put them into a fat, the properties of a fat would change depending upon the amount of unsaturation and the length of the fatty acids. Specifically, more unsaturated and shorter fatty acids will give rise to fats with lower melting temperatures. Okay, so oils are more likely to have more unsaturated fatty acids and or shorter fatty acids within them, whereas fats are more likely to contain longer fatty acids and more saturated uh, fatty acids within them. Well, the same holds for when these uh, compounds are contained, uh, not, not fat compounds, but uh, fatty acid containing compounds are contained in a membrane. These, of course, include the glycerol phospholipids, also the um, sphingolipids, and I'll also mention cholesterol briefly about this as well. We uh, think of membranes, uh, I mentioned the importance of membranes being uh, sort of fluid. That f fluidity of membranes um, is essential. And cells uh, do interesting things to maintain the fluidity of membranes. Specifically, one of the things that they do is they change the composition of the fatty acids that are in their membranes so as to reflect the environment in which the cells are typically found. Okay? So, um, if we take that uh, idea that we had, which was that the melting temperature of a fat or oil uh, obviously changed as a function of these uh, unsaturation and length of fatty acids, we can also ca carry that over to the membranes themselves. With membranes, we don't really think of a melting temperature as such, but we do think of fluidity. And so if you want to think of it in simple terms as a melting temperature, that's perfectly fine. The, um, when we look at a, f a membrane, we see a transition between the characteristics of a membrane at lower temperatures where it's what we would describe as more solid and uh, at higher temperatures where it's more fluid. And there is a transition uh, through which a membrane goes as the temperature increases and that transition is shown by this line uh, going up here. The midpoint of that transition is known as the TM or if you want to think about it as the melting temperature. That's uh, okay as far as I'm concerned. And not surprisingly that TM will decrease as we have increasing saturation and it will decrease as we shorten the length of fatty acids. Now a really good example of that um, is found in fish. Fish live in the ocean, unless they're freshwater fish, but the fish that I'll talk about here are living in the ocean. And the ocean typically is uh, fairly chilly, uh, especially if you're out this part of the, or, or the um, coast right, uh, right now. So the fish that live in that ocean need to have more fluid membranes, and that fluidity of their membranes is uh, maintained by putting fatty acids into them that are more unsaturated. Now, a lot of you interested in nutrition know, of course, that fish are a great source of omega-3 fatty acids, and omega-3 fatty acids are polyunsaturated. So fish oil is rich in unsaturated fatty acids, partly because the fatty acids found in fish need to be more unsaturated so they can comprise the membranes and help the fish to have membranes that are fluid at uh, lower temperatures. Okay, now another thing that affects the, the um, uh, membranes is cholesterol, but it affects it in a sort of an unusual way. Cholesterol does not change, oh by the way I should also show you cholesterol in a membrane, I can't recall if I did that last time or not, but cholesterol in a membrane looks something like this. Here's one side of a lipid bilayer, 
the left side, we'd have a right side over here. And we can see that cholesterol, which is shown here, projects into that lipid bilayer. Cholesterol, you may recall from the structure I showed you, has only a single hydroxyl group that's polar. That's the only part of the cholesterol molecule that's polar. And it orients itself with the polar end of the uh, glycero or sphingolipids of, of a lipid bilayer. And it puts the nonpolar part into that nonpolar part of the membrane that you can see here. Um, cholesterol, as I said, only sticks into one side of the lipid bilayer. Now, the properties that cholesterol gives to a membrane are a little um, uh, unusual or confusing. I won't say confusing, but um, what cholesterol does in a membrane is it does not affect the melting temperature. But what it does is it widens that transition temperature. So in essence, it's changing the steepness of that curve. The more cholesterol in a membrane, the wider that transition will be, and the less steep will be that transition. Having cholesterol in a membrane appears to give that membrane some important properties, and I won't say that we know in every case exactly why uh, that's important, but suffice it to say that the presence of cholesterol does affect membranes. Okay, well that's what I wanted to say to finish up talking about membrane uh, sort of chemical properties. I want to spend uh, most of today talking about uh, membranes and their use in, um, as barriers for ions because that's, that's a very important consideration uh, for membranes. Specifically, uh, the topic today is membrane transport and so I'm going to give you uh, some more terms to think about and also to think about how uh, membranes play roles in these processes. Well, membranes are effective barriers. I told you that there were only a few compounds like water, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and carbon monoxide that freely travel through the membrane. Charged particles do not. Even protons, which are the tiniest charged particle, protons do not readily cross the um, lipid bilayer. And that turns out to be very important for the cell. Well, if we have a very effective barrier, like we do have with lipid bilayers, if that can result in the formation of a charge difference across the barrier. So we have drawn here a simple scheme where I have a single negative ion over here and I have no negative ions out here. So the charge difference across this membrane is uh, not zero, okay? Meaning that there's more positive charge on the outside than there is on the inside. And anytime you have a charge difference across some barrier, you have a voltage. So membranes are important for maintaining a voltage or a potential across them. And that turns out to be absolutely critical for the function of cells. So this impermeability of lipid bilayers to ions, very, very important characteristic. Differences in concentration of ions, of course, give rise to electrical potential. Chemical potential simply, result, simply uh, means the difference in the concentration of chemicals themselves. So in this case, we would have both chemical and electrical potential because we have ion differences and we have differences in concentration of chemicals across that lipid bilayer. Okay. Another kind of pressure that we can think of relative to cells is that of osmotic pressure. And osmotic pressure is fairly easy to visualize. In basic biology classes in both high school and in college, you can get exposed to what osmotic pressure is. Osmotic pressure arises from the fact that a semi-permeable membrane, which can allow some things to pass through but not others, um, cause a pressure as such uh, to arise. And that pressure is illustrated in this figure right here in which I've taken a U-shaped tube, or someone has taken a U-shaped tube, and put a semi-permeable membrane across the bottom, allowing water, for example, to cross the membrane, but not sugar. So I've taken, this person has taken sugar and poured it into one side of this tube. And when you do that, the sugar can't cross the membrane. Well, that means that the chemical potential is different across that membrane. It means that one side has sugar, the other side does not, and so nature being what it does tries to equalize the concentration of sugar across both sides. It can't do that, of course, because the sugar can't cross, so that means that water migrates from right to left. And as water migrates from right to left, the size of the column on the left side increases, 
And if we were to take and measure the difference in pressure across these two sides, that is how much more this one is pushing down than this one is, then we would have a measure of the osmotic pressure. Okay? So osmotic pressure is arising from that semi-permeable membrane and in this case in, 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 due to a chemical gradient across it. Now this turns out to be really important. In fact, one of the questions that students asked me after um, uh, one of the first lectures I talked about was, well, why do I call glucose a poison? Okay. Well, glucose is obviously something that we eat, all right? And glucose is something that's uh, important for our energy levels, but glucose is a poison really for what you see up here. High concentrations of sugar can cause cells to burst. Okay? So cells are doing a continual battle fighting against osmotic pressure. There's one thing I want you to take away, I want you to remember that. And I'm going to show you an example later in the lecture about the importance of that osmotic pressure and how cells are continually fighting that battle. Okay, well let's, um, before I get to that I need to say a few more things about membranes. One was I showed you a schematic diagram the other day of a membrane. It had some proteins in it and it had some lipids and it had some carbohydrates, etc. I want to focus right now for the moment on membrane proteins. Membrane proteins are essential for a cell. One example I gave the other day were the integral membrane proteins that are involved in transport. Transport of nutrients into cells is really critical because if cells don't have transport proteins, important energy containing molecules like sugars and so forth can't get into cells. And that can cause a real problem if a cell obviously needs energy. So those um, proteins involved in transport are very important. Well, we categorize proteins according to several um, designations that you can see here, depending upon how they're situated in or around membranes. Integral membrane proteins are proteins that project through both sides of the lipid bilayer. And transport proteins will fit in this category uh, very nicely. Associated proteins that you can see here are not embedded in the membrane at all, but commonly associate with something in the lipid bilayer. Okay, in this case associating with an integral membrane protein. Peripheral membrane proteins are commonly embedded in one of the layers of the lipid bilayer, but they don't go through both sides of it. So we have peripheral membrane proteins shown in yellow and uh, the sort of blue-green that's there. And the last category I'll talk about of uh, membrane proteins are those that are anchored. Anchored membrane proteins are not themselves uh, necessarily embedded in the lipid bilayer, but they're attached to a molecule that is. In many cases, the molecule that a, uh, an anchored protein is attached to is a fatty acid. And that nonpolar tail, the fatty acid, sticks up into that nonpolar uh, portion of the lipid bilayer and associates very nicely. So these are terms that I think that you should know something about. Okay, now, um, thinking specifically of um, uh, integral, well, actually I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, but there, uh, this is just another example or a more close-up example of integral and anchored proteins. An integral membrane protein not uncommonly looks like the one on the left in which it has several helices okay, that are embedded in the membrane and they cross the membrane several times. As we'll see, they don't, that doesn't have to be the case, but it's a very common case for many integral membrane proteins. So this is multiple, multiple times crossing the lipid bilayer. And one of the things that scientists can do when they look at the sequence of a protein is sometimes they can determine if a protein is a membrane protein by looking for a pattern of polar, nonpolar, polar, nonpolar, polar, nonpolar uh, amino acids of certain specified lengths. Because that would be an indication that this protein needs those nonpolar portions to embed in the layer and the polar portions that are sticking out over here to interact with the water on either side of the membrane. So this is a, a very good kind of uh, device for uh, telling us that a protein is found in a membrane or not. 
An anchored protein, as I said, is, I don't really say, want to say too much about that, but it just simply is, embedded, is, is linked to something that's embedded in the lipid bilayer, and that's commonly a fatty acid. Now, what I want to do next is just show you something. I'm not giving you something to memorize here, but I want to show you a variety of categories of um, integral membrane proteins. We see here uh, in, in the, the middle two uh, sort of examples of what I showed you before. Specifically, this one was on the last slide where we saw that it went uh, across, out, across, out, across, out, across, et cetera. Multiple crossings of a single polypeptide chain. Some in integral membrane proteins, however, have multiple copies of the same chain that associate with each other, but that are not all part of a cross, 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 cross. In other words, A, B, C, and D are all exactly the same sequence and exactly the same protein. Some integral membrane proteins only have a single helix crossing the lipid bilayer. And you can see that they can be oriented in one of two ways. One with an amine on the inside and one with the carboxyl on the inside. Yet other kinds of membrane proteins um, that uh, are associated with membranes include the type 5 that you can see right here. Those would be examples of anchored membrane proteins. And type 6, which are a combination of the anchored and the integral uh, shown right there. Now I'm not asking you to memorize what does a type 6 look like, what does a type 3 look like, or any of that. But I'm just showing you this figure to give you an idea of the diversity of integral membrane proteins that are found inside of cells. Okay, and the re well, I guess another reason to show you this is just to make you aware of that there are a variety of classifications of these. Again, I'm not asking you to memorize what they look like or any of that, but to recognize that there are different kinds of integral membrane proteins. Okay, well, let's get into some terms. Um, integral membrane proteins that are involved in transport come in a variety of types. So we give different names to them. Um, I'll start with uh, this one right over here. It's called a uniport. A uniport is an integral membrane protein that's involved in transport. And by the way, not all integral membrane proteins are involved in transport. I'm only talking about the ones involved in transport. An integral membrane protein that is involved in the transport of a molecule in only one direction is called a uniport. Okay. That's, a, that's uh, one type of integral transport protein. Another type is known as a symport. Sometimes you see it written as a synport. Uh, I'm not quite sure why biochemists can't decide whether to use an M or an N, but either one of these is acceptable as far as I'm concerned. A symport is an integral membrane protein involved in transport in which two molecules are moved in the same direction. That same direction could be in, as we're showing here, where out is on the top and in is below, or it could be out. The direction, for our purpose, doesn't matter, just so long as they're both transported in the same direction. An antiport, by contrast, moves two molecules, but one goes in one direction and the other goes in the opposite direction. Okay? So these are the uh, common terms associated with these uh, transport proteins. Yes, question, yeah. Uh, the molecules moved at the same time, not necessarily, but close to the same time. Well, I'm going to show you an example in a little bit where we see one moving in and then shortly thereafter the other moving out. So they don't have to be at exactly the same time, no. Okay. Um, another term. We have, uh, when we move ions across membranes, we can move things across so that we have no result in charge. This could happen in a couple of ways. One would be if we took something and we took one positive charge out and we put one positive charge in, there'd be no net change in charge and that, that type of transport would be known as electro-neutral. On the other, I mean, we could also, if we took non-polar molecules and moved them where there were no charges in the first place at all, those would also be electro-neutral. Or if we move something so that there's a net change in charge as a result of movement. In this example, we can see two positive ions being moved outwards. And each time this protein acted to facilitate this change, 
there would be a change in charge, and so we call this electrogenic. And there's quite a variety of ways in which electrogenic transport can occur. I'll show you a, a different one than this uh, later in the lecture uh, today. Questions? I know I'm kind of moving kind of fast, but these are just pretty much terms. Okay. All right. Now, I want to start breaking down that business of transport a little bit, okay? So um, one of the things, I, one of the types of proteins involved in transport is a group of proteins known as ion channels. And ion channels are largely proteins that allow things to move through them that are charged, okay? But they don't play a real active role in the movement. They simply open up and you could say, you could think that they're acting like a gateway to allow things to move in. They don't really do much to the ion. They simply allow the ion to move through it. The ion channels can be amazingly specific for certain ions. Many ion channels will allow only one type of ion to pass through it efficiently, and others that are different ions will not pass through very efficiently at all. Now the difference between ion channels and transport proteins is that ion channels don't really play a very active role. They simply open up and allow movement through them. It's like digging a hole in the dam and letting water flow through it, right? Water's gonna flow through it, but fish aren't gonna flow through it because fish are too big, et cetera, et cetera, right? So that's what an ion channel does. By contrast, a transport protein will play an active role in the movement. Now, as you might imagine, ion channels move a lot of stuff through them very quickly, whereas transport proteins, which are having to grab a hold of molecules and move them, work much less rapidly. Okay? We're going to see in nerve transmission that ion channels are very important and because of the ability of these ion channels to specifically let certain ions through and to let them through very rapidly, we can have nerve transmission occurring in milliseconds. Okay? This is a very important characteristic. Transporters take a little bit longer. Okay. Here's an example of an ion channel known as the potassium channel. Potassium channels are important in nerve transmission. And you can see that they have very different configurations depending upon whether they're closed or they are open. When we say they're open, that means that ions can, a potassium ion can move through it very readily. And when they're closed, the potassium ion through it and no other ion will move through it at all. And there's a view from the top. And you can see when you look at these channels that they have very, very specific shapes. And these specific shapes are essential to their specificity in terms of which ions that they will allow to move through them. Okay. Another um, one is aquaporin. Again, that little hole right there in the center is where the molecule moves through. Aquaporin is a very important molecule for the movement of water across a membrane. And so you can see that little place for the water molecule to navigate through there. Okay, um, let's talk now about the different kinds of transport that can be involved in cells. I will talk about, I'll give you three terms here, they're all at the top. The first is passive, the second is facilitated, and the third is active. So there are three things about transport that you should know. The first two are very closely related. What is passive transport? Passive transport relates simply to the process of diffusion. It doesn't require or doesn't refer to anything specifically helping something to move across a membrane. We can, for example, say that a, 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 um, a membrane is porous to oxygen. Oxygen can readily move into the cell. 
the concentration of oxygen inside of a cell is, is lower than the concentration of oxygen outside of a cell, especially if the blood is delivering plenty of oxygen. And so we would expect that that concentration difference of oxygen moving into the cell will occur readily because oxygen likes to move from a high concentration outside to a low concentration inside. Nothing is facilitating it, nothing is making it happen. That is a passive process. Okay? A passive process doesn't have anything else helping it to move across. A facilitated process also relies on diffusion. This is a little confusing, but it's not too bad. A facilitated diffusion process, which is what we call it sometimes, involves something that helps that to happen. So the ion channels that I talked about are a facilitated diffusion. They open up and ions will move across them according to a concentration gradient. They will move only from a, con a higher concentration towards a lower concentration. But they're facilitated because there's a protein that's allowing that to happen through the membrane. In the first case with oxygen, it didn't take a protein because oxygen moved across the membrane all by itself. In the case of facilitated diffusion, a protein is facilitating or allowing that to happen. Now in facilitated diffusion, as I said, it's diffusion. It's, it's, it's totally determined by a concentration gradient. If the concentration is higher inside than it is outside, then the movement will be towards the outside. If the concentration is higher outside than inside, then the movement will be towards the inside. Okay. So it's a diffusion-driven process. The third process that's very important is called active transport. Okay. This also is protein-guided, but there's a very, very important element of this. And this is a definition that students frequently don't understand, so I'm going to repeat it a couple times and I want you to get this in your head. Okay. An active transport process is a process in which at least one molecule is moved against a concentration gradient. An active transport process is a process in which at least one molecule is moved against a concentration gradient. When I say against a concentration gradient, I mean it's being moved from a low concentration to a higher concentration. That's exactly the opposite of diffusion. Notice I said at least one molecule. They don't all have to be that way. We'll see some examples where they're not all that way. But if you have at least one molecule being moved against a concentration gradient, you have, by definition, an active transport process. Everybody understand that? Now, this is also protein driven. It takes proteins to do this. One of the common misconceptions is, well, okay, it's going to take energy to make this happen. And indeed, it does take energy to make this happen. It does not mean it requires ATP. There are a variety of ways in which this can happen. And ATP energy is only one of the ways in which this can be facilitated. Okay. I'm going to show you a couple of examples where ATP is not involved uh, in, the, uh, in the transport process. Okay, let's start by looking at passive diffusion systems. These are pretty straightforward. This is kind of like oxygen, cell wall, outside, inside, right? Oxygen higher outside, what happens over time? Well, if nothing else happens over time, if the oxygen doesn't get used up in, inside, what's going to happen? The concentration outside will equal the concentration inside over time. The reason that this is lower is because oxygen inside the cell is being used up. But if it doesn't get used up, these two will equalize over time. So passive processes, or any process that relies on diffusion, if left alone long enough, the concentrations will be equal on both sides. Okay. 
Here's an example of facilitated diffusion. Remember that with facilitated diffusion, we have a protein that's involved in the transport process. And we can see why facilitated diffusion might be okay, um, a little bit different. In this case, we've got a protein that's open to the outside. And we've got molecules that the cell wants to have inside for whatever purpose. We can see here that the opening to the outside allows one of the molecules on the outside to bind at a site on the protein. The binding of the site on that protein can cause the protein to change shape, as you see here, allowing the molecule that's bound to move inside. This is one way of specificity to make sure that only specific molecules are making it into the cell. Okay? So facilitated, pro facilitated diffusion is allowing this movement of this molecule. In this case, the concentration of the molecule is shown higher outside than inside. If the concentration were higher inside than outside, we would see the reverse process. We would see it moving upwards instead of moving downwards. Okay. Here uh, is a, a schematic difference between the way that ion channels work and, protein, uh, and, and transport proteins work. I mentioned it briefly before. An ion channel is basically a channel. You poke a hole in a dam and water flows through it, and there's the hole that you've poked into it. It simply opens, it allows ions of specific sizes to move through them very readily. The transport system, on the other hand, is more specific and usually involves changes in protein shape. So the last slide, what I showed you with the transport protein, okay, involved a change of protein shape, and change of protein shape takes time. So this process that we see on the right, the binding of molecules, the changing of the shape and so forth, is a slower process than an ion channel. Okay? They both are driven by diffusion. Higher concentration of one on one side versus the other. They both are specific, but one works really rapidly, that's the ion channel, and one works not quite so rapidly, and that's the transport protein. Understand the distinction? Okay, good. All right, now let's talk about active transport. Active transport involves the movement of at least one ion against a concentration gradient. And I said that a common source of energy was ATP. It doesn't have to be, but a common source is ATP. This schematic shows the involvement of ATP in the movement of ions, in this case sodium ions and potassium ions, across a lipid bilayer. And similar to what we saw before, we saw a channel that opens and closes one side preferentially to the other. The difference being that ATP energy is necessary to force a an ion or a molecule to move against a concentration gradient. Okay? You know that if you take, for example, uh, a drop of dye and you put it into a glass of water, over time that dye will diffuse and equalize itself across that glass of water. You can't put it back into its original form, and if you wanted to put it back into its original form, it would take you energy to do that. Cell, cells are doing that with active transport. They're moving against that concentration gradient. And we see ATP binding we see ATP hydrolysis here causing a change, and that hydrolysis results in the movement of ions from a low concentration out to a higher concentration in. That makes it, by definition, an active transport process. Let's look at a specific example of that, and this is a very important transport protein that's found in all of our cells. This transport system is known as the sodium-potassium ATPase. This protein is essential for your cells to remain alive. Essential. Okay? Well, let's talk about first of all what it does, and then I'll tell you why it's essential for you to be alive. 
Now, I'm not going to ask you to draw this, but I think you should know the basics about what's happening here. The sodium potassium ATPase is moving sodium ions out of a cell, okay, and it's moving potassium ions into a cell. Each cycle of the protein does the following thing. It moves three ions of sodium out, and then, and this is again a place where they're not occurring simultaneously, then after that it moves two ions of potassium in. The process of doing this requires energy from ATP. So this is also an ATP-driven process. That's why it's called an ATPase. Why do cells do this? Okay. First of all, is this electrogenic or electroneutral? It's electrogenic. Three out, two in means that each time this cycle turns, we're changing the charge by one. It's an electrogenic process. Is this a symport or an antiport? It's an antiport. The ions are moving in different directions, one in, or three in, or three out, two in, right? Okay? And it's active because we have a, because they're being moved against a concentration gradient. This, the concentration of sodium outside a cell is normally higher than that inside of a cell. It takes energy to move against that gradient. The concentration of potassium inside of a cell is generally higher than it is outside. It takes energy to move against that concentration gradient. Well, why do cells go to this trouble? What they're creating is a voltage across the cell. Very important thing. You remember the osmotic pressure that I showed you earlier? Cells are under continuous osmotic pressure. They're under continuous osmotic pressure. Think about this. Cells make proteins, right? Proteins can't move across the cell lipid bilayer. What's the concentration of proteins outside compared to the concentration of proteins inside? It's higher inside. What's water going to want to do? It's going to want to diffuse in to reduce that concentration of protein, right? Just like we saw with the sugar. Now, it's complicated what the cell is doing, but the cell is playing with the ionic environment to reduce the osmotic pressure. It's playing with that ionic environment to reduce the osmotic pressure. Because of that, the cell doesn't burst. Because if nothing else happened, the osmotic pressure would increase, the cell would start absorbing more and more water, Boom, it blows up. This pump is essential for cells to keep from bursting. That's pretty amazing. This is why your cells always need to be expending ATP. They're always expending ATP because they're always pumping those ions to balance the osmotic pressure. Okay? A very, very important pump. This pump turns out also to be very important for nerve transmission. Because as a result of action of this pump, sodium is high outside, potassium is high inside. And we'll see how nerve cells use that to transmit information. Before I talk about nerve cells, however, I want to show you a couple of other examples of active transport to convince you that not all types of active transport require ATP. Okay? Here is a pump known as the sodium glucose pump. Okay? And the sodium glucose pump is important for getting glucose into cells. Okay? And by the way, the, depending on the location of a cell, cells may not need an active transport of glucose. Okay. Things that are in close contact with blood, cells that are in real close contact with blood, tend to not need active transport of glucose, whereas others that are a little bit further removed will need active transport of glucose. Okay. Blood glucose levels are usually high enough that simple diffusion, uh, not simple diffusion, but facilitated diffusion through specific transporters can allow glucose to come in without use of additional energy. This system, however, requires energy. And it would be useful for a cell that was in the part of the body where the concentration of glucose was low. Okay? How does it work? 
Well, we see, for example, that this cell has um, uh, a pump that is pumping uh, sodium out and potassium in. That's the pump I just showed you, the sodium potassium ATPase. That's the pump on the left. As a result of action of this pump, the concentration of sodium on the outside of the cell is higher than it is on the inside, and the concentration of potassium is higher on the inside than it is on the outside. The sodium for this pump is an important consideration. A difference in concentration across the membrane results in an electrical potential. And an electrical potential is a potential energy. Just like standing on top of the Empire State Building, you're at a high potential, don't fall off, right? But your potential energy at the top is higher than it is at the bottom. In this case, the potential energy due to the sodium concentration is high. So the potential of that sodium ion concentration is used to drive the movement of glucose into the cell. What happens? Well, sodium and glucose bind to this sodium glucose transport protein. And when they both bind, the protein changes shape, moving both of them back into the cell. Well, what is the energy source here? The energy source is the sodium gradient. Sodium is moving in a diffusion process. Glucose is being moved against a concentration gradient. The concentration of glucose outside is low. The concentration of glucose inside the cell is higher. Consequently, this is an active transport system since glucose is being moved from a low to a high. It's the chemical potential and the electrical potential of the higher sodium concentration that drives this process. Notice there's no ATP here. The movement through this protein is requiring no ATP. It's a diffusion driven process but one of the molecules is moving from a low to a higher concentration, and that is glucose. Another type of uh, transport that involves a chemical or ionic gradient is that of the lactose permease. It's a very similar kind of a thing. This is a transport system that's commonly used in bacteria to get the disaccharide lactose into cells. Okay. You may have learned, uh, well actually not last term, later this term you'll learn a little bit about the lac operon of cells where the lac operon allows a bacterium to get lactose into it and to metabolize it. This lac permease is the protein that allows that to happen. In this case the concentration of lactose outside the cell is lower than the concentration of lactose inside the cell. Lactose is being moved against a concentration gradient, and the energy source that's bringing it in is not ATP again. Instead, the energy source is a, is a proton. A proton is coming and binding. You can see it actually happening right here. We see a COO minus being converted to a COOH. That change of this from a minus to a, to a, to a zero charge causes the protein to change shape slightly to bind lactose, and the binding of lactose causes the flip of the protein so that it now moves the lactose into the cell. The energy source here is a proton gradient. And proton gradients are things that I'll be talking about on Wednesday and Friday of this week when I talk about electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation. Because the energy source for those are gradients of protons higher concentrations on one side of the membrane than the other, and the membrane in that case that's involved is the inner mitochondrial membrane. We'll see more about that later. But again, this is a transport system that does not require ATP energy. In each case we talk about, this is a little bit simpler schematic of the same thing, but in each case we talk about these energy sources as being secondary. What's secondary? Well, they're secondary because usually the primary energy source was ATP. ATP was probably needed to get that higher um, proton concentration. It doesn't have to be, but it commonly is. We call it secondary because it doesn't matter how that gradient got started or how that gradient was made. 
It's only that the gradient itself was used to drive the process. So again, active transport does not require ATP directly. Okay, questions on that? Clear as mud? A lot of stuff today? All right, I'm going to scratch the surface of nerve transmission here, and then I'll, I'll reiterate this in the, the uh, lecture next time. Okay? What I hope I've started to convince you is that gradients of ions are very, very useful for cells. Gradients of ions are important in the case of osmotic pressure for the sodium potassium system. They're also important as secondary energy sources to move molecules against concentration gradients. When we think about nerve transmission, we think about something that is a process that has to move very quickly. If I stick my hand into a fire, I want my nerve cells to tell me that I've done that and to get my hand out of the fire, and I don't want to wait until my hand is charcoal before I get it out of there. Right? The faster my nerve cells can tell me what I've just done, right, the better my response will be and likely the safer I will be or the better off I will be as a result of that. Well, it turns out that nerve cells are set up in a really interesting way to use the sodium and potassium gradients. Just like every other cell of your body, nerve cells are actively transporting sodium ions out and transporting potassium ions in. And just like every other cell of your body, nerve cells have a gradient of those two across their membranes. Now one of the differences of nerve cells is that nerve cells, first of all, can be rather large, rather long. You can have a nerve cell three feet long, for example. Okay? And they have embedded within them ion channels that are specific for sodium and potassium, sodium or potassium, depends on the channel. The same channel will not do both. It'll do one versus the other. Okay? These channels are what we call voltage gated, meaning that the channels themselves respond to changes in voltage. These are a little electronic sensors. Okay? So nerve cells have voltage-gated ion channels, and those channels are specific for either sodium or potassium. Now we have different kinds of nerve cells that sense different things. And the way that they sense them and the way that they initiate the nerve signal, we don't need to concern ourselves with. In, many, in some cases, it's not known how they initiate it. But suffice it to say that nerve signaling starts by in the following way, and I'll show you more of this next time. It starts first by the opening of sodium ion channels. That's the first step. What happens if I open a sodium ion channel when I've got a gradient of sodium ions, higher outside than inside? Well, obviously, sodium is going to start flowing like a river through that channel into the cell. Right? What happens when that channel, when that charge has moved across the membrane? Do you see a voltage change? You betcha. In response to that change of voltage, the potassium gate opens. And what's the potassium gate do? It allows the potassium ions to go out and the voltage starts to come back the other direction. Okay? You with me? Now you got the end of the nerve cell and you got a whole bunch of sodium ions in and potassium ions out. That's disturbed the concentration of sodium and potassium in the rest of the nerve cell. What's going to happen? They're going to move and now you're going to see a voltage change all along the nerve cell. And all along the nerve cell, all of those sodium and potassium gates are going to do the same thing that the very first one did. And bang! In milliseconds, you see a signal moving along that nerve cell that ultimately makes its way back to the brain. Okay. 
I'll stop it there for today. I have a song about prostaglandins that I hope you will join me in singing. Prostaglandins, the eicosanoids creating pain. And they're ones to blame when you get inflamed. And ouch, they hurt inside your brain. Prostaglandins, every throb and ache gets magnified. If you hope to win, cyclooxygen's generation's got to be denied. The Fiox has all been recalled. So go get yourself Tylenol. And if you ache, blame PGH synthase. We must complain that you make the aches prostaglandins. Prostaglandin D2, F1, G2, E2, prostaglandin. All right. <laughs> See you guys on Wednesday.